Share that. And there we go. Okay. I, however, am going to at least stop my video or close it off because I don't, makes me nervous seeing myself on the side screen. Whoops. Um, <laughs> when I'm giving a presentation. So I'm okay. Um, so tonight I'm going to speak with you about amazing antlers. And uh, I have a love hate relationship with this particular uh, body part of a deer, which I will get into. But first, um, as Bronwyn said, I am a wildlife biologist. And, you know, when I introduce myself to people who outside of my field who who hear that I'm a wildlife biologist, it conjures up all these amazing things in their head about how fun and wonderful it is and, and things like that. It's really not that fun and wonderful. Um, it, I spend much of my time, you know, my mom still thinks that I, I, I snuggle with fawns all the time. I, I, I don't do that very often. Uh, Hollywood, of course, has given us all, we, we wrestle alligators. I still think that I spend a lot of my time in the field handling animals. Um, I don't do that much anymore. I spend, what I actually do is I spend a lot of my time in front of a computer and that's okay uh, because all the research and things that happen in wildlife biology needs to be, first of all, published as research so we learn more, but then that research needs to be translated to people so they understand what we're doing, why we're doing it, and why it's important. And I do a lot of that. Uh, they do let me out in the fields sometimes, but I'm usually dealing with a bunch of dead things. And if you want to learn or hear more about that part of my life, we can talk about that later. But I, I, I spend much of hundreds and hundreds of of deer heads in the fall, uh, that's management. But thankfully we are not talking about management tonight because that's boring. This is the fun stuff. So with that, we'll start with where we are now uh, in the course of a year, which is winter time. Uh, I came across this little, cartoon a few weeks ago about winter and you know in December when you have winter it's cute and it's fun and there's lights and it's snow and it's beautiful and everything and then you get to January and everything is gray and the little tagline for this cartoon that I saw was once you hit January winter is just a cold gray bucket of suck and yes yes it is <laughs> but we have this going on. So my love-hate relationship with antlers. Antlers are fascinating and I'm about to tell you all the reasons why they are. This is the love part. This is why I love antlers. The hate part is that people through history have done some pretty silly and dangerous things uh, when it comes to the pursuit of these bony embellishments. It's just Silly, uh, really. Um, but our fascination with antlers is goes way back. It, uh, it's documented as far back as 200 AD. We have been pretty much worshiping these, these bony protrusions that fall off every year. And of course, I am not immune to this either. Uh, this is the time of year where it may be a cold gray bucket of suck out there, but when the sun shines like it did today, I go outside and I try to find one, uh, one that has fallen off. So I don't know if there's anybody else out there who enjoys to shed hunting, but if you do, you understand. It's, a, it's wonderful to finally get back outside when you can experience a little fresh air, and maybe if you're lucky, find one of these treasures. I must say we found a few already, so I'm very, very excited for that. Oh, and I'm also gonna note in the bottom of some of my slides, you will see an address. And 
I, with a colleague of mine, write a blog. We have an ongoing deer uh, research project, long-term research project, eight plus years now going on in Pennsylvania, looking at deer and habitat dynamics. But we also write a blog because we put GPS collars on deer so we get to see a lot of their movements. And I have written blog post after blog post and a lot of them are on antlers, like I said, and it's crazy because everybody who knows me knows that I can't stand antlers because of all the attention they get, but I've written a ton of on them. So you'll see some references to those blog posts and I can share them with Bronwyn later if, if there's some distribution list that you're interested in seeing more. So this is what's going on this time of year. Most bucks are losing their antlers right now. And antler drop can occur anywhere from December all the way to April. There is, so there's no concern if anybody sees a deer, a buck with antlers in March, it's quite all right. He's well within the norm and they will fall off eventually. Exactly when a buck sheds his antlers is based on a few things. It's based on his testosterone levels, based on his general health, it's based on him as an individual, and it is even related to his birthday. Now, of course, fawns are all born, right, within a three-week period, so that birthday is kind of, it's not like you and I. I'm born in March, and, you know, my husband's born in October. It's not that wide, so birthday has some bounds on it. But as you can see from this photo, the buck in the center has already lost his antlers, but the buck on the left, you look down, his little head's in the grass, but he still has his antlers. It's very individual. And the mechanics of antler shedding involves osteoclasts. Those are the cells responsible for dissolving and absorbing bone. Over a two week period, these osteoclasts work to demineralize bone along an abscission line where the pedestal meets the antler. And the pedestal is where the antler grows from. So there's a line of cells along there and it just eats away at that and bam, the, the attachment is weakened and the weight of the antler falls off. Now this is an elk in Pens. I don't know if Everybody knows this, but we do have elk in Pennsylvania, uh, a nice herd of a thousand or so animals in, in central Pennsylvania. If you ever want to visit them, please come up because it's kind of amazing. I still have not found an elk antler shed, but it is a dream of mine to do that one day. So this was an animal that we had uh, captured and collared, you can see number 21, and someone was out there, had seen him on March 12th, and lo and behold, a couple days later, spotted him again, and his antlers were gone. Uh, so it happens very quickly. Uh, and once those antlers are cast, the top of the pedestals is considered an open wound. And it reacts like that. It, there's some bleeding and there's developing of a scab-like covering called a wound epithelium, which forms in as few as 10 days. Now, you're probably thinking, why is she telling me about something called a wound epithelium and what's the big deal about the 10 days? Well, because antlers, antler growth starts shortly after the completion of this wound epithelium. So, new antlers can start to grow within two weeks of the old ones being cast, which is kind of amazing. They just drop them off the minute that scab uh, forms over that pedestal, new antler growth can start immediately. And antler, antler growth is, is a complex process. I'm gonna explain it to you and you're gonna be like, well, that doesn't seem like a big deal, but trust me, I am giving you the way simplified version. I'm giving you the version that I understand. It, it's, it's crazy complex what goes on in a deer's body that allows this to happen. But it's governed by hormones and photo period, which is day length. That's what drives the whole process. And annually, antler growth begins when the days are lengthening between the spring equinox and the summer solstice. So mid-March um, through mid-April is when growth really starts to pick up. 
And in this particular uh, photograph, this deer was the last deer we caught as part of a research project in Southeast Pennsylvania, and it was on April 5th. So you can see his head, you can see those little buds. His antlers are already starting to grow. This is the 5th of April, so pretty early. And I just want to put a PSA out there for everybody that, you know, springtime is, deer do not look their best in the spring. Expect to see shabby looking deer. And that's because they have a lot going on. This poor guy is trying to shed his coat and grow antlers. And that requires energy. That requires a lot of energy. So because antler tissue is the fastest growing tissue known to man, having the capacity to grow an inch or more per day in some species, not the whitetail, uh, but some species of cervid with the big giant antlers like elk and moose have very, very large antlers. They have a short period of time to grow them. They need to pump as much energy into them as possible. They can have, you can almost see them growing. So springtime, we've cast our antlers. We're starting to grow. We've hit summertime. Summertime, testosterone is low. Uh, testosterone production is very low in males and they form these bachelor groups of unrelated individuals. Basically, it's just an old boys club. They hang out, they don't do much of anything, uh, eat and grow antlers. But this low testosterone, this is all important because low testosterone means low aggression. Low aggression is good because they are growing these antlers that is very, very sensitive tissue. Antler cartilage is unique among other vertebrate cartilage because, it, because of its abundant blood supply. And the blood supply is needed, of course, to support the high metabolic demands of this rapid tissue regeneration. So while this growth is occurring, everybody needs to stay calm. Everybody needs to be, stay very calm uh, because those antlers can get damaged while they're growing. As summer progresses, those days begin to shorten or the, that photo period decreases. This signals uh, another physiological change, which is increased testosterone production in the white-tailed deer and other cervids too. Um, this hormonal cue in antler development causes antlers to stop growing. So from the time of antler shedding in the winter spring time, it takes about 160 to 170 days to complete an antler growth cycle. So that's how long it takes to grow a set of antlers for a uh, white-tailed deer. And this particular photo was taken in the middle of July. So this is as big as this, as this deer is gonna get with regard to antler size. So antler hardening takes about a month and it starts in mid-July and it ends about mid-August, which of course people don't realize that, that once mid-July hits, deer or bucks are as big as they're going to get. They aren't getting any bigger uh, with regard to antler growth. That's it. Because it takes time for those antlers to harden because right now it's just soft cartilage tissue growing off the top of their head. So that extensive capillary network within that cartilage matrix starts to deposit minerals uh, to harden those antlers from the base to the tip. So the base of the antler gets hard first and then it works its way up to the tips of the points. And once those antlers are hardened, the velvet is shed. The velvet is that soft skin-like covering that covers and protects that cartilage matrix when it's growing. Once those antlers have hardened, that velvet pretty much dies. Uh, and then the, those animals rub it off. It just it must itch them or something because they, they must get it off. Uh, 
And now they can be used, now that antler growth is, is done, they can be used, antlers can be used for whatever deer, elk, moose do with them, which of course is to make rubs, they spar, they fight and challenge one another for that social hierarchy that's all leading up to the breeding season. Uh, antlers, of course, are all about love. Uh, this is the whole point of every species on the planet is to pass on your genes. And antlers are basically a pretty fancy uh, way of showing that, that you got good genes. So that's what they do. And here is a cross section of an antler. And it's made up of two types of bone, spongy bone and compact bone. And the spongy bone makes up that inner portion. It's, it's less dense, softer and weaker. And it is highly vascularized during growth to transport nutrients and growth regulating hormones. So that is the main line to, to get all the, the hormones and the, and the nutrients and everything that make those antlers grow, it goes right up through the middle. The compact bone, excuse me, forms the outer shell. It's denser, it provides support and strength that is needed for what antlers are used for, which of course is things like this. This is a buck, he is making a rub. They use these antlers uh, to scrape away the bark of trees. And they have, of course, scent glands on their head and they leave their scent there. This, of course, breeding behavior um, leading up to the rut and breeding season. So this is the basic antler growth cycle driven, like I said, by hormones and photo period. That's how it all works out. Uh, for a year. So this is a whole year cycle for antler growth. But while antler growth is a miracle of evolution, everything about it is absolutely amazing. Most people are interested in talking about how big they're going to get. And this is where the love hate thing comes in for me. I hate this part. As far as I'm concerned, every antler is amazing and I'm, I'm happy to see it, but most people are just interested in the big ones. So of course, I'll talk about that a little bit too. This, a buck's first set of antlers can look anything like this. All of these are, are quite within the realm of a first set of antlers. So they can be little spikes, they can be a cute little basket rack, uh, but, but this is what you're going to see for a first try. You're never going to see this on a first try. <laughs> this is a mature animal who has been growing antlers for many years and this is what you get. Practice makes perfect, beautiful antlers, so to speak. Um, but people get confused because antlers, antler expression is a combination of many things. It involves age, it involves annual and permanent environmental conditions, it involves individual nutritional state, and it involves genetics. All of these things are intertwined. So it is normal for a first set of antlers to look like this. And small antlers are common among young cervids. So all of them, elk, this is a, this is a elk yearling, his first go round at making a, a set of antlers. Good try, buddy. Middle is a mule deer, again, perfect. And of course the bottom is a moose. These are, like I said, completely normal. Why? Because growing antlers is hard. I went through that whole antler cycle. There's a lot going on. Um, because the other thing is, is these are still young animals. Nutritional requirements for body growth generally take precedence over requirements for antler growth. Because you're not going to be buying designer clothes if you can't put food on the table. 
Uh, these animals, they're young, they're still building skeletons. So to, to grow antlers, when that calcification process starts in the middle of July, you know, through August, for all animals, is they're stealing Peter to pay Paul. So they're stealing calcium and minerals from their, their bones, their skeleton, to place in their antlers to harden them. And what happens is through the year, they'll replace that um, in their skeleton. What they've stolen from their skeleton to put in their antlers, they'll get, that'll get replaced. But these guys are still growing their skeletons, so they don't have a lot to spare. So their antlers are small. They can't really put a lot of energy into it because they're still growing. So as a yearling, a buck expresses about 25 to 30% of his maximum antler potential. At two years old, the buck will express about 60% of his antler growth potential. So he doubles his antler expression in one year. Uh, and that continues as it, bucks get older. So up until they, they reach their maximum antler potential, which is around five to seven years old. So age is important, but nutrition is equally important because we know just like people, a good diet results in good growth. So bucks consuming less than optimal forage will would be expected to take a year or two longer to reach their maximum antler size. But notice, this is data from Pennsylvania, um, even in poor habitats, Antlers will still become larger as a buck gets over, older, excuse me. So when even in bad habitats, oh, a buck is still going to have larger antlers when they're older. So you see that age and nutrition completely play a role in what happens on the top of a deer's head. So those, if you think of uh, permanent, mm, I like to think of, uh, I was trying to, to think of an example with regard to uh, permanent and annual conditions. It's kind of like weather patterns, you know, the, there's the season, winter, it's always cold, you may get a few warm days, uh, but it's still winter. So think of permanent habitat conditions as the season and then annual habitat conditions or annual conditions is kind of like a weather event kind of pattern. So annual conditions are more variable, but they also have an effect on antler development. So acorn availability and six more weeks of winter, thanks Phil, uh, can, give, can have a direct and immediate effect on antler growth. For example, white-tailed fawns fed a diet simulating an early spring green up with access to acorns grew twice as many antler points as a one-year-old or an eight, at one year of age as fawns fed a diet simulating late green up. So even in that season, a, an early spring green up can have effect on what happens uh, for antler growth that year. And of course there's individual variation when it comes to nutrition. So does the deer have, do they have a sniffle? So are they late for dinner? Is their brother a bully? Uh, meaning, are they having a health issue? Because if they are, then their energy is going to be directed to an immune response, not towards uh, headgear, because that is expendable. You know, staying alive is more important than growing pretty antlers. You need to stay alive to be able to breed. Uh, meaning are they late for dinner? Is there high deer density in the area? Meaning it's limiting resources if you're not there and on time to get something to eat. Uh, social status makes a difference. If they are low on the totem pole, then while the nutrition may be there, they may not be able to access it because of their social status. 
So all these things can affect individual nutrition and therefore antler expression. Oh, and let's talk about mom. These are my favorite deer out there, the does, the ones that are often forgotten and overlooked, but I love them dearly. Uh, <laughs> another strong influencer of antler growth is, is the nutritional condition of a doe during pregnancy and fawn rearing. And it has the potential for lifelong effects, even if nutrition is improved for those fawns later in life. It is known as the maternal effect. So mom's ability to support fetal growth and produce adequate quality and quantity of milk contribute to offspring growth rates. I have written a post, there's another post called Mother. Uh, it's a blog post I wrote because I called these little guys milk vampires at one point. Um, they will suck the life right out of mom. Uh, a doe is supporting, when she has a fawn, she is supporting her metabolic needs as well as her offspring. So if you think of basal metabolic rate, which is the bare minimum number of calories you need to just be, uh, it doesn't include walking, blinking, digestion, nothing. It's just minimum of what a body needs to exist. So if you think of that, that's basal metabolic rate. Gestation is a little over one and a half times basal metabolic rate. Lactation, over twice metabolic rate, basal metabolic rate. Peak lactation for twins is almost five times basal metabolic rate. If you add in the other energy needs that I alluded to, like walking, feeding, digestion, blinking, uh, the caloric bill for a doe in the summer is really steep. And by the way, antler growth is about one and a half times uh, basal metabolic rate. So it's a little bit higher, but not nearly as close as lactation. Uh, lactation is the is the most meta, is the meta, oh my goodness, I can't even speak. <laughs> the most the metabolically most expensive thing any mammal can do is lactation. Uh, so uh, more power to them. It, it, it's amazing. Like I said, uh, mammals are amazing. It has been demonstrated through research that fawns born to mothers in poor nutritional condition may never attain their growth potential their entire life, regardless of the changes in nutrition later in their life. So if mom is at a disadvantage, that disadvantage is passed on to her offspring and it can follow them through their entire life, even if their nutritional plane is increased. And it may even carry over multiple generations. Often when it comes to uh, talking about antlers, uh, the water cooler talk goes to genetics. This is usually, if I hear this one more time, if I, someone sees a buck like this and they say, oh, he's, he has bad genes. No, no, he doesn't. He is just trying really hard and you know, it's his first go around. Uh, because a buck that looks like this as a yearling, it doesn't necessarily mean he's not going to look like this as an adult. Why? Because growing antlers is hard. Uh, there are many external factors that affect antler growth. I just went through them all. And it's impossible to separate one from another in the wild. You have age, you have habitat, you have individual circumstance, you have mom. Uh, all these things contribute to the expression of antlers that we see on a deer. It, most of the time it has nothing to do with the genetics of that deer. And of course, what about mom? I'm always bringing mom up uh, because we know that the condition of a doe has a profound effect on antler expression, but we don't know what genetic component she provides. 
because a fawn is a product of the combination of DNA from a buck and a doe. And there is no reason to think that either sex makes a greater genetic contribution to antler size. But of course, given the supportive role that mom plays, she may have the largest impact on antler size and that's not just genetic. So let's get to some of the things that can go very, very wrong with antler growth. Like I said, this is a complex process. I gave you the simplified version because that's the version I most understand, uh, but lots can go wrong. I get photos all the time of crazy things that people see out there, and this is one of them. So three antlers. I saw a deer, it has three antlers. It's crazy. Oh, yes, it is a little crazy, but I have an explanation for that. This is because, look at that antler, those antlers. Um, <laughs> this particular animal, I got this photo and this deer has three antlers. Yes, yes, it does. Why and how can this happen? Well, cells in the pedestal uh, where antlers grow out of on from a deer's head will grow antlers wherever they are. We have, well, I haven't, but there has been research that has placed pedestal cells in another part of a deer, like on its leg, and lo and behold, it grows an antler. It will grow an antler out of its leg. So what has likely happened with these deer is that there has been some damage. They have hit their head somehow, and some of those antlers, of uh, those pedestal cells have been transformed to another part of the head. And lo and behold, that cycle will continue every year and will grow an antler wherever those cells are. So sometimes you get a crazy deer with three antlers. Another pretty common issue uh, with antlers gone wrong is injuries. So I alluded to before that in the summertime, testosterone is low, so there's low aggression because these things growing out of the top of their head are very, very sensitive. And if something happens to them, they break, like this one. Uh, he has obviously had an antler injury. And what will happen is they have this antler injury, but it's not going to break. I mean, obviously, it's broken from the pedestal, but it doesn't break off. That cartilage matrix and those nutrients are still being pumped into that antler and it will calcify like that. So he is gonna have a pretty unique set of antlers this year. And I have a nice little photographic story of an elk in Pennsylvania. So antlers can get you into trouble in more ways than one. Uh, and swing sets are the absolute worst. So this poor guy had a fight with the swing set and lost, obviously. He got all wrapped up, wore himself out. I can only imagine how stressed and anxious this animal was after losing a fight to the swing set. Uh, we came in, some of our staff came in, darted this animal, uh, helped him out blindfolded him when we, you'll see animals with blindfolds when we capture them is because that really calms them down. So that's the first thing you do, if, even if you, they're sedated, the first thing you do is cover their eyes. So this is this animal, he has been sedated. He has been liberated from his swing prison, but you can see his right antler is, is completely broken. It was broken at the pedestal. Uh, it's hanging down. That is not good. I can only imagine how painful it is for that animal. So what happened was when he was freed, they saw that injury and they sawed off his antler. This of course happened in the fall. His antlers are already hard. They are bone now. There's no nerve going up into that antler. So they, they sawed it off and they brought him back around and Let's see what happens to him. This, there he is a little bit later. You can see he obviously didn't learn his lesson. He's got some greenery hanging from his head. So who knows what he's been fighting with now. 
thankfully it wasn't another swing. Uh, but you can see that pedestal is actually straight up in the air. So excellent, he's doing well. Here's another photo of him a little bit later. You can see that pedestal. He's still got a little bit of an abrasion on there, but it seems to have healed. And there he is a year later. So I, it, from, from knowing what happened with his antler injury, that pedestal completely being broken, and this is what he looks like a year later, or the antlers that he produced a year later, Wow, uh, you can see that his brow tine on that side is split and it's maybe a little bit difficult to see from the photo, but one of those split brow tines, the, the velvet on it is white. I have absolutely no explanation as to why it did that, but, and, and obviously it's the only area of that velvet that did turn white, so who knows what went on, but again, Injuries, when you see an animal or a deer, or if you're somewhere that has moose or elk, if you see an antler that don't conform to what they should, you know, that symmetrical shape that we all know, it's usually attributed to some sort of injury that they have had, either to uh, the pedestal or to the antler itself when it's growing. And it can stay with them their entire life or it can heal. It all depends. So just because they grow a funky rack one year doesn't mean it's gonna happen the next year if they can heal. But uh, some things that go wrong with antlers can be not a good thing. Uh, this, what you're seeing in these photographs is known as an antleroma. Uh, an antleroma is a neoplasia or tumor uh, that is the result of unregulated cell growth. Now, unregulated cell growth, it can be benign, but just because it's benign doesn't mean it's not detrimental or doesn't mean it won't harm the animal. Uh, unregulated cell growth can be a bad thing. The cause is not understood, but it's obvious that that tight control of cell growth that from antlers are that antlers are known for is not happening. So deer antlers are the only completely regeneratable organ found in mammals and have an extremely rapid growth rate a growth rate that surpasses cancerous tissue growth. Yet deer have very low cancer rates, five times lower than other mammals. Gene expression profiles of antlers have a higher correlation with osteosarcoma, that's the most common type of bone cancer, than, than with normal bone tissue. So that antler, those antlers growing off of that deer's head right now, if you look at them from a gene perspective, it is more of a bone cancer growing off their head than normal, the bones that you, they find in their body. So the same genes that allow for control of rapid antler growth may contribute to a deer's low cancer rate. Many tumor suppressor genes are under positive selection and strongly expressed in antlers. Uh, these identified genetic mechanisms open the door for further research to understand how cervids are able to pull this off. Basically, how can cervids, deer, elk, moose, how can they have um, basically bone cancer growing off their head and control it? because that's what the antlers are. It is a controlled growth, rapid cell growth. Um, there is research going on. I am not one of those researchers. I am just a humble biologist. Uh, <laughs> so I learn about this stuff through research papers. I don't do it in person, but who knows? The humble deer genome may hold the cure for cancer as we know it. Uh, which again, amazing. 
So the awe and wonder that we have as a species for antlers may actually be well-founded. Uh, maybe there's a reason we, we find them so fascinating and worship them that they hold something special. They are special. And maybe one day we'll figure out how. So with that, that is my presentation. And I'm happy to try to answer questions should anybody have any. Janine, that was wonderful. Can we un can you unshare and we can come back together to do the Q&A? Yes. There we go. Let me, let me put a spotlight on you. Thank oh, you goodness. <laughs> Um, we had a couple of questions. Um, uh, Randy asked during the, the presentation, can you address QDM relative to antler size? I'm sorry, what was that first part? QDM relative to antler size. Is it in the chat? Because I don't, I don't even understand the question. <laughs> Randy, Randy, if you're still on and you want to, um, Quality deer management. Oh, Q, QDMA. Yes. Okay. Quality deer management. Now I, I got you. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> yes, quality deer management. Quality deer management is um, a way to manage your, your herd, so to speak, as a private landowner. So the premise of quality deer management is to have deer in balance with habitat, meaning uh, not overpopulated, and you protect yearling bucks. As I said, if you protect a yearling buck, if you let it live just one more year, you double its antler size. So the premise behind quality deer management is to have um, a balanced herd uh, with not overpopulated of, of does, so to regulate, um, uh, any any species really is you need to harvest or limit reproduction. And the way you do that is to harvest females because those are the ones that produce. This is not a monogamous uh, breeding system. It's polygamous breeding system. So you only need one male and he will fertilize many females. So to control that population, you need to remove females. So quality deer, deer management, you remove females so that the herd is balanced with the habitat and quality habitat helps with with antler expression and you protect your yearling uh bucks to let them get a little bit older so good quality habitat older bucks you get bigger antlers and let's face it that's what hunters usually like they usually like a larger deer now when it when it comes to antlers don't get me wrong uh we have many deer in our freezer right now and only Maybe one of them is a buck, they may all be does. So, um, but most hunters would love to harvest a large antler deer and quality deer management kind of helps them do that. And Janine, I guess, it, is it also going along with that, making sure that the, you made a, a, a the mother, it's the mother part of it. So that the health of the mother being, being uh, playing a, an important yeah. role in that. Absolutely. Them, feed them, can, you, can you give them extra food if it's in a managed um, you know, place? So uh, I'm gonna tell you right now, feeding wildlife is bad. I'm gonna stand on my little pedestal. Do not feed wildlife and do not feed deer. They don't need it. If you wanna help deer um, improve the habitat and balance the herd. Deer do not need our help uh to survive they have survived they can survive winters in quebec in northern minnesota uh down here in the mid-atlantic pennsylvania maryland winners winners are a joke to white-tailed deer uh they they are they have everything that they need uh and then some so please don't feed the deer uh improve habitat much much better for all wildlife all right, do not feed deer. Um, and let's see, Catherine asked, what is the best way to take antlers off a skull of a deceased deer? Um, it depends what you want to do with them. I mean, 
if they're on there pretty good. You're not really going to get them off uh, because of that. While the they fall off every year and like, bam, they just fall off. When they're on there, they are on there. Uh, if you want to remove the antlers to do something with them, uh, cut them below the pedestal. But really, there's no way to like pop antlers off like you see with those sheds. They're not going to come off naturally like that. Um, and Lynn wanted to know, uh, to, in the picture with the, the deer and the swing set, the deer's ears look tagged. Was that correct? Yes, yes. He got into a little bit of trouble. And usually um, all state wildlife agencies normally do this. But for us in Pennsylvania, because we have such a small, finite elk herd, any elk that we're able to get our hands on, we tag them. So they are individually identified. So in the future, if we come across them again, we know who they are. We have their history uh, and what they've done, what they haven't done, and if they've been in trouble or not been in trouble. So we have, um, like for elk, like I said, we have finite herds. So any animal that we get a, our hands on, they'll be tagged. Our bear program, we tag bears. Uh, and of course we have deer, we have a deer research program. All our deer are tagged when we, we purposely go out to try to catch them, tag them for our research project. So yes, that animal did have tags in his ears. Um, Deborah wants to know how, what do the bucks do to replenish the lost calcium, um, while forming antlers? Do they eat a specific plant that has a lot of calcium in it or do they eat maybe soil or something? Well, all deer eat dirt, some amount of dirt. That is uh, true. Uh, <laughs> and it's, that's more research, but it, they just, they get, they replace it just through their diet, through normal eating. So um, the nutritional value of plants changes over the year. Uh, the course of a year. So springtime, they're different nutrients. I really can't rattle them all off in my head, but deer, the, I didn't do the natural history presentation of deer, but uh, deer are what are considered concentrate selectors. And if you compare them to say a cow or even an elk, the shape of their face. So if you think of a cow, think of how wide their nose is, they are all about volume, anything, all that they can eat, as much as they can eat. So they are about volume, and then they let their rumen try to extract whatever they can. Deer, if you look at their nose, it's tapered. So deer go around and select specific plants um, for specific for their, their liking, so to speak, because they have a much smaller rumen, so they need to make it count. Uh, whatever they're extracting. So deer, don't ask me how they know, but they know where they, what they should be eating. That new growth in the springtime, oh, it is super yummy. Uh, anybody who lives in an urban or suburban area with deer know that if you fertilize your plants and all that landscaping, those plants have lots of nutrients and lo and behold, deer seek them out because they know. And how they know, I, I don't, who knows? I know I like cake, but <laughs> how much nutritional value is in that? E, I'm probably, I probably wouldn't make it too long out there. Um, Mary, and Mary wants to know, what does a velvet antler feel like? Is it super squishy? Is it mostly firm? And we it's, have, we do have an ant, we do have a, 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 a taxidermied animal that has the velvet on, so you can come to the museum and actually feel that, but not, mm. not, not alive. It, it's very, very soft. It, I mean, if you look at it, it looks soft, it feels soft. But the crazy thing about a growing antler, if you touch it, is it's warm because it's growing. Um, so it's got that blood supply in it and and it's like it's hard like cartilage it's not you know if you touch a growing antler it's not going to move around i mean of course there's a little bit of, of give to it but it, it's solid but the the one thing i can say about them is is that they're very very soft 
and they're warm. <laughs> so. Um, Randy asked, are all, most or all atypical white tail racks due to injury while in velvet or is there another cause? Uh, most is usually due to an injury. Um, atypical racks, uh, you know, people often say genetic uh, related. As, as deer get older, if they get, when I say super old and super old for a deer is like five, for a buck is like five years old or six years old. I mean, that's old. Um, it, I mean, they can, deer can live into their teens uh, in the wild, in a hunted population, we have tagged does that we have documented that are 13 or 14 years old. So it can happen. And we did, did even have a buck up there that was 10 years old. So deer can live that old. If they do live that, bucks do get up there. They, you can start seeing different crazy things in their rack. Like, you know, you'll see a drop time or, or different anomalies like that. Um, most of them are, can be, most of the ones that you see out there are usually from an injury. Uh, it's usually not genetic unless it's symmetrical. Usually if, if, if the anomaly is symmetrical, meaning it's on both sides, then that is likely in the genes because those genes, they code for the, um, the, the, the frame of the animal or the frame of the antler, so to speak. But one little anomaly here or there, it's usually some kind of glitch uh, when it comes to antler growth. But if you see it, if it's symmetrical, some sort of symmetrical uh, difference in a deer, that is usually genetic. And you'll see that as an animal gets older. Uh, Lynn asks, is the stimulus for reindeer male female antlers the same, testosterone and seasonal light, I guess across all of the um, service? Yes, it is. And I didn't bring it up in this particular presentation. Perhaps I should have added it in there that yes, female whitetails can even grow antlers uh, in rare instances. And for them, it is a it's a hormone disruption that usually causes that. So for reindeer, it would be the same thing. It's still driven by hormones, still driven by day length. Uh, it's just, it's different for them, obviously, because they don't have the, the amount of testosterone that males do because they don't have testes, but still it's those hormone fluctuations that cause that growth. And along those same lines, Mary was asked about the difference between male and female antlers and what advantage to antlers do the females, the antlers give females in the, in the species that the females grow antlers? It's a good question. I don't know what the specific antlers, well, you know, there are many different theories about why, uh, why antlers. Uh, why did nature choose to select for antlers? Because in you know, the Chinese water deer, they have de overdeveloped canines. That's their sort of signal. Um, they don't have antlers. So the, with antlers, it, 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 it's a visual cue of um, fitness. But it also can be used in defense. It can also be used for social hierarchy because those, those things are all important because deer are social animals. There is a social hierarchy that goes on. And if you're at the top of the hierarchy, you get first access to resources. So with females, that female servants that do have antlers, I, I would venture a guess that it has something to do with defense and social hierarchy because they really don't need it for breeding because let's face it you know they get their pick uh all the boys want to be with them that's as simple as that so they don't really have to worry about 
finding a date, they're good to go. Um, but I would say it's defense and uh, social status that would drive that in those systems. So in terms of defense, you're talking about with predators coming and, and, and has that been seen that they're actually using the antlers to yeah, save they off have, predators? Yes. Yes, they have used, well, I, a recent paper that was just published, I hope I don't get it wrong, um, in the out west, in the Yellowstone ecosystem, they did a, a study with elk and when they drop their antlers and, uh, and prey, as because they're obviously a prey species and there are wolves, there are, are mountain lions, out there during that time of period that they would be dropping their antlers. And they show that there's a fine line. Um, the, the elk that keep their antlers longer are less likely to get preyed upon uh, than elk that drop their antlers sooner. But if you drop your antlers later, there's that energetic cost of keeping those antlers longer. So there's that fine line that they have to walk. How long to keep those antlers for defense against possible predation or drop those antlers to save that energy? Um, so yes, they have been used or they have been seen to be used to in protection um, against predation. Uh, Thomas has a question that a lot of gardeners have. How do you keep the, the deer out of a garden? People have put plastic fences, but that's not effective. Are there safe and effective ways to limit damage to vegetables? Sorry, the answer is no. <laughs> I won't sugarcoat it. Uh, one thing, you know, there are lists out there about deer preferred species and least preferred species. And what I tell people, if a deer is hungry enough, it's going to eat it, whether it's on that list or not. Um, the only thing that's effective in keeping deer away or keeping deer from eating anything is a physical barrier that they can't get to that plant. Um, and, you know, it, it all depends on how big your garden is. I had a little garden once wasn't very big and I only had a little plastic fence that was you know yay high maybe five foot high um but it was small so I figured oh the deer are not going to jump in there to get my garden because it's too small they don't really jump into small spaces they certainly can jump over that fence but they the small space it was fine and my garden did well it did fine until the fall and I had squash in my garden and I was just about to harvest them and the day I went out to get them every single one of them had a bite out of it because the deer went over knocked my fence down and took one bite out of every squash in my garden I was not happy um and that's why I feel bad for all the gardeners out there that live <laughs> where there are white-tailed deer because good luck I don't know how you do it um there are, of course, things on the market. You can put uh, deterrents on there. There are different deterrents where there are taste deterrents, there are smell deterrents. But again, if it's a taste deterrent, they actually have to take a bite to know that it tastes bad. Um, and you have to keep reapplying these things. So the best advice I can give you is keep them out of it. If you can't keep them out of it, uh, like, I'm, I'm sorry. I, like I said, I feel really bad <laughs> for gardeners everywhere. <laughs> um, Mary, why are, I mean, Janine, what, Mary wants to know, why are moose antlers flat and bowl-like? Well, why are elk antlers just, you know, large and, and spike-like? It's, it's just how they they change. It's just every species is different in what pressures they, they were put on there. And if you see moose, they're, they are much, much larger uh, than whitetails or elk. And the amount of, and if you've seen, I've seen video, if you've seen photos of moose pushing one another with those antlers, if they were to, the amount of of course, there, there are fossils that we have of, of other critters with gigantic antlers, but it's, it's how they push and pull that pressure 
I imagine that's what put selective pressure on how they developed over time. So with as specifically, I don't, I don't know uh, why they're bowl shaped, but actually that's on my list of finding one of those sheds one day too. I don't know how that's gonna happen. I don't spend a lot of time in moose country, uh, but it, it all has to do with how they use them. Um, I'm not aware, I don't wanna speak out of turn, but moose, ha where moose live, uh, they like aquatic uh, species they feed on them. They're in marshy areas and things like that. There's probably not a lot of opportunity for them to make rubs and scrapes, things that uh, whitetails certainly do. And so there's no pressure on them to be able to get around trees and things like that. Uh, so their antlers can be different shaped. So it, it's the way an antler is shaped or any, any adaptation for any animal, it depends on what environment they were there in and what pressures were put upon them. So. Um, Randy asks, having removed many or most natural predators from white tails in Eastern US, have we changed the genetic pool relative to antler size due to not needing them much or for, for defense from predation? So is it selecting we, down for that? Right, right. No, the, the genetic diversity in white-tailed deer is very, very high, and the gene flow is good. And I say this because we've done some genetic work in Pennsylvania that measured gene flow in different areas. So there's there's good gene flow. And actually, um, while quote natural predators are are not really abundant in the Eastern US anymore. We still have the number one predator out there, which is us. Uh, we, the number one cause of mortality for deer in Pennsylvania is hunting. Uh, hunting mortality, if a deer is gonna die in PA, it's usually by a hunter. So just because we don't have wolves, we still have bear um, in Pennsylvania and there's still bear in Maryland, Western Maryland. Um, so while there may not be cougars or wolves anymore, there's still people and we do a pretty darn good job of, of keeping deer uh, a prey species out there, so. Does the size of the, the antlers inhibit any way mating? I mean, or no? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. And they have done uh, some research. <laughs> so they were like, uh, obviously antlers play a role in, in some display of fitness, right? They're, uh, they're an outward expression of how fit my genes are and I need to be attractive to the ladies because I, I wanna get as many as I can. Because that's the other thing, um, because it's polygamous mating system, uh, it was often thought that females didn't really have much of a say. It was the dominant male that did most of the breeding and hey, whoever big man on campus was, that was gonna sire your fawn. Re genetic research since then has showed that females actually have way more say in um, the this kind of breeding system than we knew of before. So uh, in Texas, I don't know if anybody's on here from Texas, I'm sorry if they are, but uh, <laughs> I always say Texas, they have done some crazy research and they have actually in Penn studies have taken deer, uh, males have Remove their antlers, like sawed them off, and then put on different size antlers and watch the behavior of the females in the pen to see who she chooses to breed with or where he ends up in the hierarchy. So yeah, bigger antlers do usually attract more women. Uh, I don't know what it is, but yes, it, it, it doesn't inhibit you know, physically inhibit, but it can be a, a good a good thing if your antlers are bigger for for breeding purposes. The size does matter in the. Deer I animal. guess it does. <laughs> 
And so Mary also asks, it kind of goes along with this, is, is there a species that have a matriarchy instead of a patriarchy? Um, the, in white-tailed deer, the system is pretty matriarchal. You have, um, you'll have a, a uh, they, they call it a rose petal. Um, and what and why is because if you if you think of it as starting with a single female and she has white-tailed deer 90 percent of the time have twin fawns and i say twins because they're born at the same time they are not necessarily necessarily full siblings this is what i said about breeding uh there is multiple paternity in fawns in twin fawns which is just crazy which means she bred with more than one male and those two eggs were fertilized by different sperm um so if you think of a uh start with one female and she has two fawns say they're two doe fawns what will happen when they grow up uh they will share part of her home range they will have their own home range but they will usually share part of it with their mother and then they have their fawns and you can see so females usually cluster if you think of these all over the landscape they're more genetically related um closer together so it is pretty matriarchal it Bucks usually don't associate with females most of the time. The only time females really have anything to do with the males is during breeding season. Other than that, they're off doing their own thing. Um, so it, the breeding system, it, it seems simple from the outside, but it's pretty complex. And uh, females have as much say in that breeding system as the males, even though it is polygamous. So. It's not like hyenas where it's completely, you know, female matriarchal dominated. Um, there's more of a give and take when it comes to cervids. All right. Any other questions for Janine tonight? You can raise your hand, put them in the chat box. We can unmute, um, give a question. That was also, that was, it's, it's, don't the, um, the antlers play a role in the development of the musculature of the neck? And has that, or could, is that also with the younger ones can't support a larger rack because their, their muscles aren't, aren't um, uh, fully developed? Um, no, not necessarily. I mean, uh, <laughs> people, People aren't the best, let's just say. When it comes to, <laughs> you may have seen some pretty grotesque photographs of um, pen raised deer that have been, you know, specifically bred to grow these. There is no other word I can use for it, but grotesque antlers ridiculously large. I've seen photographs and I wonder to myself, how in the world is that deer even holding up his head? That is not normal. In nature, um, while well, everybody thinks the giant deer, I wrote a blog post on it, it's called Average Joe, look it up. But everybody is after that huge antler deer and they are not the norm. The norm is average kind of like you and me, you know, you, not everybody looks like a supermodel, not everybody looks like, you know, Chris Helms or, or, or um, Chris Evans, that's who it is. Oh, Captain America. Um, those are the anomalies out there. Most deer are average. They are, they're, you know, an eight frame, they're, doing what they do. It, it's, they're not the ridiculously large. So that neck musculature really doesn't play a role in it. Now, if they have a stronger, more developed frame on them, that may elevate them in the hierarchy, in the social hierarchy of, of that system. Um, but it's not because of their antlers that they have that development. So remember, Deer are just like us, they're average, 
Every now and then you get a Chris Evans out there, but that is not the norm. <laughs> right. Well, well, deer may be average, but antlers are nothing but no, they're not your average anything. So they are amazing. <laughs> And uh, just know that they grow so quickly, and and it, it's it's a, it's a fascinating um, part of our natural history, and one that we continue to try to to uncover the secrets behind, um, because you just think they're the only animal that can regenerate a mammal that can regenerate an organ like that on a regular basis. It's just really amazing. So. Thank you so much, Janine, for coming and sharing your knowledge and expertise with us. We are all smarter for it. And now that you've laid all this information down on us, our job is to share it with other people and make everybody else smarter. So, <laughs> um, and uh, I hope that we'll see you all at future talks and in person at the museum or out in the field for a wonderful field experience with the Natural History Society of Maryland. Thank you all, stay well um, and stay curious. Take care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.